Yeah, just can go whenever you want, John. Okay. Should we make a start? Yeah. Welcome, colleagues, to the next session. Um, this panel is entitled Masculinities, Sex, Media and Precarity. We've got three speakers, um, a very international panel. So we've got colleagues speaking from the States, from the UK and from Greece. And we're going to go following the format that is listed on the website. So our first speaker is Gabriel Ojeda Sage. And Gabriel is a poet and a scholar living in Chicago. Um, as a poet, he's most recently the author of Living My, uh, Lo Losing Miami, which is um, published by The Accomplices and was published last, last year. He's currently a doctoral student at the University of Chicago, where his research focuses on the history and aesthetics of gay pornography, a subject very close to my heart. It's where I did my own PhD on, and of course, I, I uh, published a book a few years on the very same subject. Um, the title of Gabriel's talk is The Death of Arpad Miklos, The Comb Combustible, Exchangeable Body of the Porn Star. So over to you, Gabriel. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. So let me share my screen. I want to say before, you know, too many images come up that I'm sharing my screen and I have some images that are based in pornography, but none that show explicit sexual acts or genitalia. Um, and the other content warning I want to give is that this talk is about suicide, um, specifically about the public life of suicide. And so I don't get into detail about anything particularly suicide theological or anything like that. But I do want to just say that the content is um, in that direction. I also want to say that this essay is part of a series that I've been working on, at least for the last couple of years, of essays on individual careers of gay porn stars who have had pretty lengthy careers, um, a rarity somewhat, and uh, specifically focus on the issue of interiority. And this one is about Arpad Miklos. The first was about Francois Sagat, which was published in the Porn Studies Journal. And the second one is on Tiger Tyson, and that one's not done. So don't even worry about that one. Um, so let me start by saying that there's no way that I could guess why the gay porn star Arpad Miklos killed himself on February 3rd of 2013 at the age of 45 and after 18 years of performance in the industry. As the suicide removes from the stand the only person who could truly account for it, it is so personal as to be entirely opaque. And for this very reason, in its wake, the suicide becomes a public good, traded, debated, mourned, mocked. I cannot say why Arpad Miklos killed himself, but my interest here is in the fact that so many people believe that they can. Fans and commentators commonly assert that his death was a direct outcome of his work that it was obvious that his motives are the same motives as the other gay porn stars that died around the same time as he did, including Roman Ragazzi and Wilfried Knight in a so-called epidemic of gay porn star suicide. These reactions range greatly in tone and agenda. On the side of the sympathetic, uh, take for example, fellow porn star Colby Keller's reflection on his blog in light of Nicholas's death on the precarity of sex work. Keller writes, it can take its toll emotionally the naked body is a vulnerable body after all. Oh, I'm trying to switch slides here. There we go. <clears throat> from outside the industry, take for example, the litany of pop journalistic pieces from outlets like Gay Star News and Out.com among others that ask, quote, what psychological effect does it have on a man when sex stops connoting pleasure and human connection and starts being work? <clears throat> and on the more speculative and more mean-spirited side. Take, for example, the comments on the Data Lounge forums responding to why men like Miklos kill themselves. To quote just one anonymous poster, he could have had the world but chose a dead-end career, literally. In the popular imagination, when a porn star dies, porn itself is the likely killer. Why does porn star suicide seem to inscribe its own answers? Unlike celebrity suicide, which comes with at least some public expressions of shock, porn star suicide 
excuse me, porn star suicide is treated as already containing a motive in the shape of the genre itself and the labor associated with it. This paper treats this pattern I've identified by looking at the career of Arpad Miklos in greater depth and thinking about his star text before and after his suicide. Through the work of scholars in star studies and porn studies like Richard Dyer, Susanna Passanen, as well as sociological and critical studies of the public life of suicide, I argue that this frequent blaming of porn as the killer in the case of the porn star suicide reflects not viewer understandings of the experience or precarity of sex work, but actually reflects viewer anxieties about how their own bodies interact with the bodies on screen. In other words, I think porn viewers believe that, as Keller said, the naked body is a vulnerable body, at least online. And that some of what characterizes pornographic viewership is a belief that that viewership mixes worship, resonance, and identification with injury. Why would access to the mediated naked body of a particular star lead to such a concretely imagined psychology? As much as stigmatizing cultural cliches lead us to think that we interface with porn stars only through their bodies, the case of reactions to porn star suicides shows just how much in our vested interests in their image, we also interface with what we imagine are their interiors, the minds we invent for them in our viewership. Arpad Miklos, a Hungarian chemist, had his pornographic debut in 1995 in Kristen Bjorn's The Vampire of Budapest, an ethno-fetish porn film with a vampire twist by what was then the most globally known European gay porn studio. With a look that fit the studio's 90s aesthetic of chiseled and not too hairy masculine European men, Miklos worked exclusively with Kristen Bjorn for a handful of years, performing all kinds of Soviet eluding comrade in arms films that played up his Hungarian heritage. Come the turn of the 2000s, after a move from Budapest to Miami, Miklos began to bulk up and expand his work to American muscle studios like Raging Stallion and others. Throughout his career, he was known for his burly and softly paternal look and exclusive top positioning. Directors tended to cast him alongside identical rugged men or alongside twink waifs with whom his larger form would contrast, a casting choice Perfume Genius mimicked when he cast Miklos as his counterpart in his music video for Hood. In 2004 and 2005, Miklos won Grabby and Gay Vienna Awards for his performance as Hank in the Western-themed gay porn epic Buckaroos Part 1 from Colt's Buckshot Productions, which is the topic of the next part. So Miklos makes for an odd casting choice in Buckaroos Part 1, whose Americana landscape is populated by white American and Latino American actors. His look fits quite well aside his rugged co-stars, but presumably because of Miklos' accented English, the film's production team decided to dub his character Hank's lines with a different actor's voice doing a country American accent. In the film's fantastical story of two friends coming to realize their love for each other via the help of a Cupid-like leather daddy named the Man in Black and his enchanted belt buckle, which makes anyone who wears it sexually irresistible, Miklos plays a small role with a single sexual number. In it, his character Hank and Hank's partner Will, played by Ricky Martinez, under the influence of the enchanted belt buckle, kiss and stare at themselves in two separate mirrors. This is the first time we see that even the wearer of the buckle is not immune to its charms. The sexual number that follows begins as foreplay with the mirror, lips against their own lips, dick against their own dick, and then turns to autofellatio by both Martinez and Miklos independently and beside each other, leading to cum shots into their own mouths. The scene of Miklos as a dubbed cowboy Narcissus is a useful allegory for my concerns here. Miklos, his true voice removed, and his image concentrated and costumed as to become the perfectly pornographic Hank, acts the part of Hank's obsession with Hank's own image. In the film, the buckle turns the real men into incontestable sexual images perfect visions for desire, an idealized and fantastical model of what the camera does to the porn star. In this sense, the film is clearly a metapornographic allegory for the image's capacity to seduce, with Miklos and Martinez's scene being one where the image and the onlooker are one and the same. Of course, these are porn characters and not two men actually hypnotically desiring themselves. So we might say instead that it's the porn viewer who's asked to become as hypnotized as the characters are. In other words, that what we see is Miklos as Hank desiring Hank, what the viewer is being asked to do is to desire Miklos as Hank in the same way that Hank desires Hank. 
because one cannot really fuck a mirror, this scene has to turn to autofellatio to keep its conceit and achieve its generic money shot in a clever way. But let's notice how strange this turn is, as without the mirror image, we have to assume the desired image is now held in his body, even though Miklos was kissing the mirror just before. Now he's just pleasuring himself like the viewer is, albeit in a likely more acrobatic way. And the idea of the image he desires is now just that, an idea of his body as both his body and not his body. I'm highlighting this scene in Miklos's career because it's a useful allegory for how in pornographic viewership, the porn star's body is made into an image that both is the viewer's body and is not the viewer's body. I think this is part of what Susanna Passanen meant when she referred to pornography as an exchange of fleshy intensities. The porn image is where we believe, in fact, where we hope that our flesh and the flesh of the porn star simultaneously get confused for each other and make clear their strictest differences. It's from that very exchange between flesh that we begin to invent so much about the porn star's interior and our relation to them that we know them. The performance studies scholar David Graver writes that the exterior of an actor's personage, the physical gestures and features that we associate with a star, think Barbra Streisand's nose or Miklos's hairy chest, is what we fetishize to feel like we commune with their assumed to be much greater and more intriguingly complex interior. As in, in the very look at the star's body, what we see before us, we invent that which we do not see, which we could never see, which is really only a reflection of our own optimism about what we think really makes up the star, us, and the space between. These are the conditions of possibility alongside a wide assortment of stigma against sex work for the pattern I identified earlier, in which the porn star's suicide is treated both as an obvious end result of their career and as an occasion for evaluating the effects of one's pornographic viewership. A month after Miklos died by suicide, Ivan Lozano's Image File Press released its first issue, an e-zine of art and poetry titled Mourning Our Pod. As a document made by artists doubling as fans in mourning, it's a really useful resource for thinking about the wake of Miklos's death. Because of time constraints, I want to show you just one image from the e-zine. In a photograph by Joel Parsons from a series titled Memorial Selfies, a notepad displays a comparison tally between the categories started jacking off, thought of our pod and stopped, and started jacking off, thought of our pod and kept going, with the latter category just ahead, tallied supposedly between a period of a month beginning three days after Miklos's suicide. In its ambiguous wording, Parsons' piece does not make clear if thought of our pod means to fantasize about our pod at all as a sexual object or to remember his untimely death. Indeed, the easing as a whole seems to posit that in the wake of Miklos's death, there's no longer a discernible difference. His suicide causing a confusion for fans between what it means to be mourning our pod and what it means to be fantasizing about Miklos sexually. But Parsons' photo is also disturbing for the almost necrophilic subtext of its confession in the sense that the slight lead of the kept going category seems to imply that the thought of Miklos' death is just not enough of an anaphrodisiac. The photo concentrates an anxiety that runs throughout the easing, a nagging feeling that while pornography and sexual fantasy are the media by which Miklos remains accessible after death, they may also be the very media that created the conditions for his death in the first place. While certainly elegiac, Morning Arpod seems to deal more in its own anxieties about what kind of pornographic viewer the artists are or might be than in what kind of pornographic icon Nicholas is. Mixing mourning with self-judgment, it can't help but think of the legacy and afterlife of Miklos's image as a product of the afterlife of its looks. As an homage, Morning Arpod wants to say he was a real person with gratitude for being lifted up by his image, but it can only manage to ask did I ever know he was a real person? Or is he still a real person now? As it tries to shake off the feeling that the history of erotic viewership it represents irreversibly let him down. Lisa Nakamura has written that the early promise of the internet to make every user a potential star has since contracted to offer seemingly deeper or more intimate user access to stars from old media instead. Both are probably true in the case of Arpad Miklos, but her comment that the internet gives a new dynamic medium to a star text's balancing act of public and quote unquote private information 
is especially noticeable here. If we follow the sociological lineage coming from Emile Durkheim in thinking that suicide stages a problem in the public-private divide because the death, an individual act in response to collective social conditions, transforms the deceased within their social web, then we can see how suicide, the internet, stardom, and pornographic viewership all share a particular relationship. It's a connection scholars like Shazbir Puar and Brett Kruch have already dealt with in the suicide of Tyler Clementi, an American college student whose roommate saw his sexual encounter with another man through a webcam left running in their residence. A case that highlights many of the same anxieties about sexual representation online as Miklos's death does. But my reason for going to Miklos as a case study here is that it's so apparent how the distribution of images of his body leads both to a public imagination of his psychology and to an anxious reevaluation by his viewers of the effects of their erotic looks at his body. If porn is where assemblages of interpenetrating flesh, to use a phrase of passanens, are invested with a variety of meaning by both producers and individual viewers, I think of the experience of revisiting or reframing Miklos's pornography in light of his suicide as a kind of meaning overload. The real and tragic death of Arpad Miklos represents his image's combustion, its meaning now infinitely more than before, carrying for its viewers a memento mori, an admission of guilt, the completion of a teleology, a pattern of shame, all inside its erotic legacy. In the wake of his death, Many obituaries, tributes, and news reports forwent the name Arpad Miklos, calling him Peter Kozma, as if the reveal of another name for this man would somehow fit the feeling that his star image had just been turned inside out by his suicide, revealing a personhood that was somehow always there and never there in his work to begin with. But perhaps not surprisingly, it was a false reveal, not his birth name, which was more likely Ferenc Korma, but the name he used among friends in the United States, the suggestion of director Kristen Bjorn. The gesture of this AKA, which comes so often in the case of porn stars dying, being arrested, or making news, news headlines for things not related to their porn work, is a microcosm of the larger pattern I'm identifying here of how viewers interact with porn star texts. The gesture of revealing what is beyond the mediated flesh on screen is indeed just an effect of that very flesh, another one of its surfaces, like a chain of paper dolls. What we see is the reveal of depth in a star text is more often than not, the reveal of the counterface of our beliefs about how we and the star text live together. That's all from me, but I did just wanna show you my work cited. This is all just stuff that I either directly or obliquely referenced in the span of the talk. So if you're a YouTube viewer, you can pause and look at it. Otherwise, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thanks all. Thanks so much, Gabriel. That was uh, fantastic. It was really, re really rich piece of research and really kind of reminded me that there are, um, there are many layers of which you can kind of think through the significance of porn stars, which kind of counters the, um, the, the still pretty prevalent attitude that somehow um, what's known about porn stars is kind of self-evident in its meaning and self-evident in its intent. So I've, I, I, I've written a, uh, a question down and I'm sure people at the end of the presentation will have questions for you too. So let's move on to Alex. Um, okay. Let me just draw up the file. So Dr. Alexandros Papadopoulos is the principal investigator of Transmedia Labs of Storytelling. Um, that's in the Department of Audiovisual Studies at Ionian University. He's taught performing arts and media at Liverpool Hope and Edge Hill, as well as literature and history at Manchester. He's also published, performed and posted extensively on fragile masculinity, social media aesthetics, criminal artists and artistic crimes on and off cinematic screens. Um, he's also a regular contributor at the International Queer Art Festival of Dis Civil Disobedience in Athens. This man couldn't be more exciting if he tried, I think. And he's present, you're very welcome. And you, his presentation is called Blogging, Pigging, Stripping, Exposing the Exposure to Queer Risk Across Screens, Streets and Time Feeds. 
Over to you, Alex. All right. Uh, may I ask, can you see the screen, everybody? Yes. I take it for yes. All right, then I begin. So today I want to discuss about how risky it is to act like big, to meet with other bigs, and to tell stories about bigs. Or to be more accurate, I want to stress how mobile understandings of risk correspond to mobile interpretations of beginnings. And also how mobile phones contribute to the mobility of that meaning, even beyond the boom of hookup apps. So my main point will be that there is not only one fixed type of body or morality or identity attached to animalistic attitudes. The dance between peak and risk that I want to unpack involves a rich repertoire of experience that ranges from sex to violence and from gay cruising to police brutality. Many parts of this vast universe of experience fitted together in one single story. This was, this was an actual memory-based story that happened to me and I used as a fuel for, perform for a performative tool in the opening of a photography exhibition of the Queer Art Festival Civil Disobedience in January 2020, one month before the lockdown. This is organized once a year and this is a place where art, queer art especially, is mixed with politics, porn, and fun, as you probably can see in this picture here. So today I want to present as quickly as possible this act of storytelling, which is called Pigs and Feathers, and its playful but also reflective and analytical interaction with some of the visual art that was presenting there. Also, I would like you to, to allow me to devote most of my time to the story itself and not to the analysis, because not only because this is a more listener-friendly thing for the Zoom conference, but also because I believe that storytelling is in itself a way of developing and provoking ideas. So my third point is to tell a story is to make a point. Now, this is how, how the story began. In 2015, an anarchist attacked me, threw me to the ground and hit me really hard. This incident took place in, in a central square of Athens, the so-called Exarchia. This is the anarchist central of Athens, a place where Molotov cocktails are set alight as often as joints. Around midnight, my attacker came from the dark and shouted at me in broken Greek, Malaka, wanker, and Asphaliti, which means secret policeman. He told me that uh, he thought that was a secret policeman because he saw me photo shooting the remnants of a car that had been destroyed by fire during street riots a few hours before. So he demanded me to give him my mobile phone. While he was on top of me and patting me on my head, it was quite difficult to explain that my phone was an instrument of art, of course, and that my initial inspiration was to recreate the image of Kropotkin or Bakunin performing belly dance within the smoking ruins. Now, what was even more difficult was to use my mobile phone to take a picture of our bodies or at least of the shadows of our bodies in order to show him that our current brutal bodily attackment could also be recreated as a formidable anal intercourse or else as two plain pigs who perform some sort of rebellious Kama Sutra in the dirtiness of that street. What I could not do with my phone was done amazingly by a Greek artist, George Karapunakis, in a series of paintings. Allow me to, yeah, this one here and this one here. Uh, I believe that this combination of smooth and vivid colors evoke both the night lighting of a potentially dangerous street, but also the lighting of a rave party. And also this Bondas costume here looks both as an instrument of submission and the flag of passion, freedom, and fun. Now, let's think about this type of reversal here. Under what circumstances can the recreation of some sort of brutality return back to us as a wave of sweetness? I have argued it before, and I want to argue this again, that this process is one of the avant-garde weapons of social media arts. Arts that we sometimes exercise 
by using nothing more than a mobile phone. The ritual goes like this. We experience a disaster, physical, psychological, or professional. We make a post about it using words and images, and the resulting piece receives 125 likes or five likes and one heart. It doesn't matter. What matters is that these digital signals of approval travel like flying thumbs deep into our virtual bum or into any other ethereal center of pleasure. This is how we make an art out of intimacy, out of sharing injuries from a distance. I describe this process as existential sondering. Under this spell, under the spell of this psychobodily intercourse, pleasure follows up pain and exhibitionism follows up humiliation in the same way that one image follows the other in our social media, in an endless train of associations, distractions, and flashbacks. For example, to return back to the story in case, the image of me being kicked by a man over a phone, kicked my mind 15 years into the past and landed me in a bus stop not far away from this anarchist square in another place which is called Vathi Square. There, I flirted spontaneously with another man who looked like a prince of pigginess. Just like the manic anarchist, he looked like a wild, macho, sexy, and dangerous. He also spoke broken Greek in a way that broke my sense of orientation. If I had to associate his appearance and his style with a piece of land, that would certainly be somewhere by the sea. And by that, I do not simply mean that he was uh, from a place fully hit by the sun because of his super tan skin, but also that he was himself the embodiment of the coast. His body inspired you to lie on it, sunbathe, and sleep there for a thousand years. This idea of a man who looks like a coast and a coast who looks like a, which looks like a man, I think is encapsulated in these pictures here who are made by the Belgian painter Emmanuel Barouillet. Now, unlike the anarchist, this man slash coast slash pig was available for conversation. It took me for a cruising tour in the local ocean of Baudre, Bo, uh, Brodel, sorry. Sadly, the brothel managers did not really approve of his style, and neither did the receptionists of the local sinful hotels, one of whom told us that they could not provide rooms for two men. It was their policy. When we finally found the hotel, the man slash coast slash pig consumed greedily some sort of white powder, got rid of his clothes, and turned himself into a half-asleep piece of furniture. Now, the sexual encounter that ensued is captured graf graphically in this picture here, made by Nikos Stamatopoulos. After a while, uh, the quite high but not so horny man retrieved the role of warrior pig and made an exhibition of his ability to kick in the air. Now, at that point, I decided to leave, only to realize that the door was locked and that I could only leave only when the man slash cause slash speak will decide to let me go. When we actually left the room, one thing that will never leave his hands was my mobile phone. He kept it and to my despair, he refused to give it back. And while we were walking away from the hotel, I pretended that I wanted to go and buy a sandwich and I find the opportunity to call the police through a landline. This was a move that I soon regretted it because after I came out, uh, the men of the coffee shop understood what I did, circled the man like a cause of a Greek strategy, and tried to warn him not to socialize with me. The second reason for my regret was that as soon as I jumped onto him and fought with him on that pavement, I got my mobile phone out of his hands really quick and really easy. So all of his mastery, all of these martial arts of dancing, all of this wild, rocky, piggy style appeared to be a facade, a posture, a surface. So getting back my mobile phone felt like swimming up out of the bottom of a sea that lie underneath the concrete coast of that pavement. And this exact feeling is captured in this picture that I have made. Now, in this picture, somehow, I try to reveal that the fluid surface of a pavement 
can work as a mirror in which you can see yourself turning into a pig. And this happened only a few moments, a few moments before more pigs joined our company, the policemen. Responding to my previous call, policemen came, found us, and when I explained to them what has happened, they dragged both of us to the nearby police station and they kept both of us on the same cell for the whole night. At some point during five or six o'clock in the morning, a policeman came in the cell and started slapping the man slash coach slash pig in the same merciless way with which an anarchist will punch me 15 years later in Exarchia Square. But unlike this latent, latest incident, I could not think of taking this act of brutality, putting it in different canvas, and making it a piece of art peak play. However, surprisingly so, there was an artist that did this, added a completely different perspective to this brutality. And this artist was none other than this same man slash pig slash cause. And how did he did so? Only with one simple question. As soon as we got out of the police station, he asked me, would you like to have a look at sneakers in the nearby window displays? There are some good shops around here. So I saw this man and I considered that there were still bruises on his face. But he was implying that everything was very, very cool. And he was acting as if we just got out of a place of entertainment, a sex club, not a cruel police station. It was at this moment that I realized that what has pushed this man to keep my mobile phone was not only some sort of power, uh, power grid or some sort of profit-based grid, or not only that, what pushed him to do that was a desire to stay with me, a desire to be some sort of companion. Now, I had expected him to be, to realize, to embody a fantasy of wild sex. He expected me to embody companionship. I wanted him to be a pig. He wanted me to be a human. And in, in the process, both of us assume interchangeably both of these roles. Now, I have made a picture in order to somehow represent this type of bonding, or even better, this wasted possibility for bonding. And this is the picture for that. Now, at this point, I ended my story in the exhibition. I don't know if I have made much time, but in fact, what I wanted to tell you is that what was presented here was neither the final ending or the final beginning of that story nine, of the storyline. Pigs and Feathers was pre-told and retold repeatedly in ways that mix the content of the story with the precarious conditions of storytelling. These past events are continuously refiltered, represented, and reinterpreted by the piggy creativity of an ongoing present. And where does this time fusion game take place? Where else? On the digital timelines of social media. Months before the opening of the exhibition, the story that was about to be narrated was prefigured and advertised through fragmentary snapshots like this one. Now, made in a room in Liverpool, these icons treat pigginess as a force that both attracts you to risk, but also pushes you back to a static and safe environment. However, domesticity here is not exactly safe. Here comes Another snapshot, which is staged on a studio flat in central Liverpool, and it claims to have a view of the police station in Athens. Now, this was a few days after I was informed by my landlord there that I had to leave the flat. Now, this was the eighth time in eight years that I had to change, to change my home because of a landlord that acted like a pig. Now, my final example is this kind of photograph where I try to recreate what it means to encounter a peak sensation in a bus stop in Liverpool, choosing for the background this kind of neoclassical building that made Liverpool be described as New Athens in 19th century. Now, when I was making this picture, a girl attacked me because she thought that me using a mobile phone in a public space was a threat to the woman who was stand by. So she forced me to have a look at my private pics 
to see that I'm not dangerous. To conclude, the con first conclusion, the conditions under which you retell a story is part of the evolution of the story, a part of the risk that is associated with that story. Conclusion number two, to act like a pig morally, sexually, or socially might have some persistent characteristics that make it look like an identity. And quite a lot of them, especially when it comes to porn and gay sex, are described amazingly well by Florencio Joao in his new book. However, pigginess can also be a very fluid, very spontaneous, and infectious style of moving, changing, and transforming oneself and the others. And this fluidity is not limited to one type of body, gender, or vulnerability. It is highly possible that the same social actors move from the position of victim to that of a violator and vice versa very, very quickly in the course of one day or night. And any dualistic categorization of gender or human or sexual identities into fixed moral positions is more ideologically toxic than any physical experience of toxic masculinity. Marx used to say, nothing is solid, everything melts into the air. I think that this is very well applied to the privilege or to the disadvantage of acting like an animal. Thank you. Alex, thanks so much. That was fantastic. It's always really interesting at a conference like this to hear uh, um, people talking about their creative practice. So our, our artist talks, I think, within the context of this kind of conference are really important. I'm sure there are going to be questions about um, the relation between your, your own personal experience and that as an embodied art practice. I guess questions related to the use of mobile technology within that. And there's probably also something to say about the performative nature of pigdom, perhaps that, 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 you know, there are a lot of things that can come from your presentation. Let's, without delay though, move on to Jamie. Hi. Are you ready? Alex needs to stop sharing his screen. Yes, lovely. Thank you, Thank you Alex. So, an introduction. This is our final presenter for today. Last but not least, Dr. Jamie Hakim, lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia. Um, Jamie's research lies at the intersection of digital cultures, intimacy, embodiment, gender and sexuality. And these are themes that he's written about in his recently published book, Work That Body, Male Bodies in Digital Culture, published by Roman and Littlefield. It's a book I can't recommend highly enough. Jamie is also the principal investigator on the ES ESRC funded Digital Intimacies, how gay and bisexual men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. Jamie's also a member of my own AHRC network, Masculinity, Sex and Popular Culture. Today he's going to talk about digital intimacies, gay and bisexual smartphone medium mediated intimacy during the post-2016 conjuncture. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you, John. You'll see that uh, the titles, well, the, the subjects changed a little and you'll see why. So hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Jamie Hakim. And today I'll be speaking about that ESRC funded project that I'm currently running called Digital Intimacies, how gay and bisexual men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. It's hosted by both the University of East Anglia and Edinburgh University and is partnered with the sexual health organisations, the Terence Higgins Trust, London Friend and Waverley Care. We're an interdisciplinary project that draws on expertise in cultural studies, sociology of health and social, social anthropology. We're hoping to make a two-pronged intervention into contemporary understandings of how gay and bisexual men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. So the first intervention we hope to make is to look beyond current preoccupations with gay men, casual sex and hookup apps and by focusing more generally on smartphone use, capture the multiplicity of intimacies practiced by these men. Secondly, we want to situate these smartphone mediated intimacies 
more fully within the social and cultural contexts in which they occur. In today's presentation, I'll be concentrating on this second focus by speaking about the approach we're taking when we try to understand these smartphone mediated intimacies within their wider and social cultural context. So this approach is called conjunctural analysis and it was developed by the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham under the directorship of Stuart Hall in the 1970s. The term conjuncture, taken from Marxist thinker Antonio Gramsci, refers to a period of time, specifically the arrangement or balance of social forces during that period of time, the economic, the social, the cultural, the political, the technological, and so on. Conjunctural analysis was developed in response to debates that were taking place in Marxist theory in Britain in the 1960s over the role that the economic had in determining the arrangement of a particular conjuncture. Against the economic determinism of what Raymond Williams called vulgar Marxism, in which the economic determines the final shape of the conjuncture, the CCCS argued that all the social forces had equal capacity to determine or overdetermine the conjuncture in complex and unpredictable ways. There were similar debates around technological determinism, especially in Williams's book on television, in which he critiques Marshall McLuhan's approach to technology and historical change. There's no time to get into these today. Suffice to say what it means for our project is that we, that we are, as I've said, considering the ways that gay and bi, bi men use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy within the wider set of conjunctural relations they're doing it in. We've therefore organized the project into three work packages. Firstly, we plan on interviewing 40 gay and bisexual cis and trans men in London, Edinburgh and the east of Scotland about how they use their smartphones to negotiate their cultures of intimacy. Secondly, we're looking at a range of documents in the material context in which they do this, looking at, for example, changes in the gay scene, access to sexual health, changes in smartphone technology and the broader economic and political context in which all this takes place. Finally, we're analysing pop cultural representations of smartphone mediated intimacies, television shows, memes, uh, journalism and so on, to analyse the discourses which are available to these men to make sense of their own smartphone mediated intimate practices. The intention is to integrate the data collected from these different strands in order to arrive at our final analysis. We're nearly halfway through the project and have only just started carrying out the interviews. So I can't imagine what this might be yet. So what I'll do in the remainder of this presentation is outline some emerging thoughts and questions that we're thinking through at this stage. And in doing so, hopefully make the case for the value of using conjunctural analysis to make sense of gay and bi, bi men's smartphone mediated intimacies. So one of the first things that's necessary to decide when carrying out conjunction analysis is what period of time is it that you're interested in analysing? When is the conjuncture and which of its constitutive social forces gives it its distinctiveness? When we started the project in July 2019, it seemed that the political was the definitive social force and that we would have to understand gay and, bisex gay and bi smartphone mediated intimacies within the context of the shattering of the neoliberal centre, and also called centre, and the rise of right-wing populism on the one hand, and on the other, what journalist Matthew Iglesias has called the Great Awakening, the renewed interest in progressive causes, democratic socialism, anti-racism, sexual violence, trans politics, especially amongst younger generations. 2015-2016 was pivotal here, with, in the UK context, the vote for Brexit and Jeremy Corbyn becoming leader of the Labour Party being key conjunctural events. Then coronavirus happened. We are currently undecided as to whether we can say we are living through the coronavirus conjuncture, but even at this early stage, it's clear that there is not a dimension of the post-2016 conjuncture that has not been affected by the pandemic. Certainly the small number of interviewees we have so far spoken to have all touched on how the pandemic, lockdown and social distancing have affected their intimate lives, both on and offline. So perhaps let's start there. The place that gay men's smartphone mediated intimacies are occupying in, if not the coronavirus conjuncture, then at least a time of physical distancing. 
in the UK, this question has already proven contentious. Between March and August, leading sexual health organisation and indeed project partner, the Terence Higgins Trust advocated that gay and bi men abstain from sex with people outside their household, encouraging different forms of digital intimacy instead. Survey data from the London School of Health and Tropical Medicine has shown that during April and May, when the UK's lockdown was most severe, about one quarter of the MSM they've surveys were still hooking up, either regardless or despite of these calls for abstinence. During this time, there was some intense moralizing on hookup app profiles and other social media platforms about even entertaining the idea of having sex with someone outside your household. One of the things we intend to capture in the interviews are the smartphone mediated tactics that differently situated gay and bi men are using to negotiate this time of uh, physical distancing. Having said this, whilst looking at these smartphone mediated intimacies will remain central to our research focus, we are not only understanding coronavirus in terms of lockdown and physical distancing. As I've already said, we're understanding the pandemic as a conjunctural event that has shifted the arrangement of social, cultural, economic, political, ideological and technological forces of the conjuncture in which these intimacies are taking place. So as an example, something that has become abundantly clear is that the pandemic has precipitated an economic crisis potentially similar in scale to the Great Depression. What even the medium term effects of this will be are currently difficult to imagine. What we're seeing in the UK are many businesses going into administration with a concomitant hemorrhaging of jobs. And this raises the following issues that we're currently thinking through. The first is the potential further closing down of queer spaces across the country. Partially drawing on Kane Race's formulation, something we're currently asking is what will the balance be between the communal and technological infrastructures of gay life within this new conjuncture? Since the emergence of gay dating sites and the parallel closing down of spaces where gay men had traditionally negotiated their intimate lives, bars, clubs, and sex on premises venues in particular, which position you take in this debate, which, sorry, whichever position you take in this debate, one thing that is clear is that it's likely in the current crisis that more LGBT venues will close. Soho stalwart balance is already being sold off. Once again, shifting the balance between the technological and the communal infrastructures of gay life. And again, we hope to capture this. Related to this is the rise of unemployment in a labour market that at least since 2008 has become more precarious, less well remunerated and less well protected. Already we are seeing that smartphone mediated intimacies have a place here. We ran a webinar a few weeks ago on one of our speakers, Mark Thompson, co-founder of UK based black gay male organisation Blackout, said that some of the younger men he knew were opening OnlyFans accounts in a bid to make some money in response to the new economic situation. This echoes media reports of a 42% rise in UK content creators signing up to OnlyFans between March and July uh, 2020. We're also interested in the role that platforms like OnlyFans, as well as other smartphone mediated forms of sex work will play in the pandemic or post pandemic conjuncture. One perhaps unpredictable consequence of the pandemic has been the global explosion of the Black Lives Matter protests. In London, in the place of the annual Pride event, but like so many other mass summer, gathering, mass summer gatherings, were cancelled to reduce the potential of COVID transmission, a Black Trans Lives Matter protest took place instead. And this represents a high point of a set of processes that have been occurring over at least the past five years, whereby what we might call intersectional questions have been raised in particular ways in LGBT plus politics, especially in relation to trans folk and people of colour, and in which the digital has been key to both their organisation and visibility. Black Lives Matter is, of course, a hashtag. There is a related set of intimacy politics here, not least in relation to sexual racism on and offline, the decision for some people of colour to only practice intimacy with other people of colour as protection from this racism and the various places that trans folk occupy in queer spaces of intimacy where cis white gay men remain hegemonic.
These issues have acquired unexpected visibility and intensity in the current conjuncture. And again, we're interested in the place of the smartphone in this. There are also broader conjunctural questions that we're currently thinking through. The perhaps temporary delegitimization of right-wing populism after the spectacular inability of leaders like Bolsonaro, Trump and Boris Johnson to handle the pandemic. The related, at least partial, relegitimization of science and experts in British public life. The increased platformatization of everyday life and the subsequent growth of digital capitalism during physical distancing and its consequences for socioeconomic inequality. During this moment of rising unemployment, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos has reportedly increased his personal wealth by $48 billion, that's his personal wealth, due to Amazon's ability to hoover up retail transactions when bricks and mortar shops have had to close. And in the UK specifically, although no doubt elsewhere, the so-called end of neoliberal austerity, uh, despite the government massively overinflating the money it claims it wants to spend on public services and funneling it into private corporations, often with links to the UK cabinet to do so. Neoliberalism by another name, perhaps. These issues might not have any, might not have obviously immediate connections to gay and by smartphone mediated intimacies. And perhaps by the end of the project, we'll realize some of them won't. However, one thing that using conjunctural analysis enables us to see is how seemingly disparate social phenomena are connected in unexpected ways that reveal something about the distribution of power during that particular moment in time. Okay, in lieu of any resounding project conclusions, I'd like to end the presentation with some brief reflections on the value of using this approach to understanding gay and bisexual men's intimate lives, digitally mediated or otherwise. So I believe the benefits are twofold. The first is, um, sorry, yeah, the first is in terms of what looking at queer intimacy as well as intimacy more generally can bring to the practice of conjunctural analysis. This practice is reasonably obscure, but continues to inform scholarship that appears in well-known journals such as cultural studies, new formations, and in particular soundings, where before his death, Stuart Hall with Doreen Massey and Mike Rustin would frequently publish pieces of conjunctural analysis. It's rare that questions of intimacy, queer or otherwise, appear in contemporary conjunctural analysis, concerned as it so often is with capital P politics, and analyzing election results to understand the balance of social forces in a particular place and time. This seems contrary to the original spirit of cultural studies and its groundbreaking insight that popular culture and everyday life are sites of hegemonic struggle. Since second wave feminism, we have known that the personal is political. And as Jeffrey Weeks often reminds us, or has often reminded us, struggles over intimacy have come to define political life since at least the 1960s. The legalization of gay marriage and its normalization or homo normalization across the political spectrum tells us something about neoliberalism in the post 2008 conjuncture. And the deeply contested struggles over trans lives are similarly revealing about the, the balance of forces in the post 2016 conjuncture and remain so in 2020. Paying greater attention to these intimacy struggles, I believe, would benefit those of us who practice conjunctural analysis. The second benefit of conjunctural analysis in this context is that it helps show how queer life is connected to worlds outside of itself. There is a tendency in some, in some versions of LGBT or queer studies to understand queer cultures, primarily in relation to LGBT or queer social histories the legalization of homosexuality, Stonewall, gay liberation, the HIV AIDS crisis, the rise of homonormativity, gay life on the internet, and so on. Queer people inhabit a multitude of worlds, albeit through different social locations, and all of this bears mapping. Conjunctural analysis is not the only method that can be used to do this. Queer Marxism after John D'Amelio looked at lesbian and gay life in relation to capitalism. Michel Foucault's work in relation to the institutional logics of disciplinary societies, the sociology of intimacy in relation to the social dynamics of late modernity. In these, in these approaches, there is a tendency to understand queer life in what Gramsci called epochal terms, 
or in relation to long historical epochs, instead of shorter historical conjunctures. These epochal understandings are vital, but so are conjunctural understandings. This tie to historical framing brings into focus what is more immediately at stake politically and socially in the cultures that we analyse. In terms of understanding gay and bi men smartphone mediated intimacies, we at the project are hoping that using conjunctural analysis will help pull out the historically specific political significance during a crisis ridden conjuncture in which they are once again proven contentious. Thank you. Jamie, thanks so much. That was marvellous. Um, unfortunately, Gabriel had to leave. He's got a, a, a pet-based medical emergency, so he won't be around for questions. We've got time for questions, though. Um, so what I'm going to do, I've, I've just got a quick question that I want to ask Jamie, kind of a, a a cultural studies nerdist type question and then let's move on so inevitably jamie it's a question about terms of reference as you as you as we both know the choice of language really matters for us in cultural studies because we're all the children of raymond williams to a greater or lesser degree so my question, I, I love using the term conjunctural analysis. I think it's really um, exciting to me that you've resuscitated the idea or <laughs> reclaimed the idea. So, but what I want to know is how does conjunctural analysis work as a frame versus contextual analysis versus intersectional analysis versus network analysis versus theories of assemblage. So what is it that conjunctural analysis offers that helps you frame your object of study? Sure. Um, okay, so um, I guess the list of other approaches that you've talked about, the things they have in common, is their attempt to approach, I guess, social complexity mm -hmm. and to move us, uh, move us on from um, kind of liberal ideas of the individual subject kind of with autonomy acting rationally and so on. And actually there's a, a greater degree of social complexity um, uh, that, you know, I think most people in this room are gonna, are gonna be sharing. Um, that, you know, those sort of approaches. So the conjunction, so in terms of, you know, intersectionality is the complexity in relation to identities and structures of oppression, race, class, gender, sexuality, and so on. Um, assemblage is used differently by different people. In actor network theory, it's assemblages of techno, technological and, uh, and human, but non-human and human, sorry, you know, not just technological. Um, and so I think what conjunctural analysis does is it gives a much more kind of historical, um, it's, I'm not necessarily sure that all of those would necessarily immediately pull out um, the historical significance of the cultures that they are analysing. They're, yeah. they're interested in different sorts of complexity. So my first degree was, uh, was history, actually. And I think there are lots of different ways into um, cultural studies. And, you know, uh, you know uh, Richard Hobbit was a literary theorist, I think, and Stuart yeah. Hall did different things. And, but, there were, you know, E.P. Thompson was a historian and Stuart Hall did history. And then it's developed and, you know, it's this massive thing and it's developed in different ways. And I'm absolutely interested in cultural studies as thinking of it as a history of the present and, and thinking about the historical significance of contemporary culture. And so conjunctural analysis allows me to see the kind of historical significance of contemporary culture in ways that perhaps the other things show you different yeah. uh, types of social complexity, if you see what I mean. I think one of the real strengths of your work, and it's something that I notice over and over again, is that you're eminently quotable and eminently stealable. Every mm -hmm. time I hear you talk or read something, I think, God, I wish I'd thought that idea. That's very kind. Thank Please you, create that idea as quickly as I possibly can. <laughs> Thank you, John. And and today is exactly the same. I'm you know I'm struggling through writing mine and Clarissa's book, and I've just heard you speak and thought, oh God, that's such a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, let's let's move on to questions now. Gavin's got a question, and rather than me posing it for you, Gavin, I'm sick of the sound of my own voice, so I'm unmuting you immediately. 
So Joao says, I could do that. Yes, yeah. Go for it. Okay, so, so thanks, Jamie. That was that was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you you it's following on from the, the the question about sort of conjuncture, but but also kind of picking up on the fact that you were recognizing that there's a generational component to that experience. And I wondered if you engaged with Keir Milburn's book on generation left. Ah. <laughs> well, in, in which case, <laughs> and what do you what do you think an attention to, to to sexuality and gender, um, in addition to what Keir's doing, might add to that that form of analysis? Because it it seems to me that that it, he's quite good in describing the generational aspect or experience of of the present conjuncture, but not all of the markers that he identifies necessarily resonate, I think, with, with gay male culture or, or, or politics. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I love this book. I think it's fantastic. And yeah, in terms of understanding the importance of generation, it, it just, I think he says that generation is this conjunctious class or words to that effect. But, and I think that's very persuasive, actually, as an argument. Um, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I, may, I am in terms of the stuff that I'm looking at at the moment, I'm, I think there is a, so I've started to read some of the interviews that James, uh, the postdoc on the project who's in the room has started to do and, and they're brilliant. And I mean, that, that one of the areas that we're looking at, as I said, is, is the questions of, of race, gender and sexuality. And I think um, the degree to which there is a developed and much more widely available language around question about around intersectional questions which was his you know is, is an academic kind of idea and it's called different things but has been dis dispersed amongst social media um that 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 kind of woke politics thing i think is very present already in the work that we have done and particularly um i mean the 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 lucidness of the um, of the QT pop people that we have spoken to, in terms of articulating um, that don't necessarily have an academic background, but in terms of articulating these intersectional structures of oppression in their own life and using it to reflect on their own experiences of digital media, and I think that is I, I mean I, uh, that isn't as present in research that I've done previously, um, and. I haven't looked at the older people yet, actually, who we've interviewed, so I can't, um, I haven't looked at those interviews yet. But, um, but yeah, the degree to which, and, and not only in the interviews that I've read, but in terms of the cultural production, especially on social media, um, I, I, I mean, I don't think this is necessarily a surprise. I think this is something that's probably widely known, but the, the, the articulateness of reflecting upon one's race, gendered and sexual personal experience, um, is something that's very striking about this younger generation who are interacting on the internet. I, 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 yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's one of the things, that's one of the most prominent things at this moment that I've noticed around the generation. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Then, you're right, Keir's book is fantastic. In terms of the, the, the research idea that I'm pulling together at the moment and thinking about mi middle age and generation more generally, mm. it, it really helped me to kind of clarify my thinking. I think it's a very mm. powerful piece of work. Joao, you've got some questions, have you not? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, I mean, actually to, to the, the, the three speakers, I thought it's a shame uh, Gabriel is not able to stay because of the cat, but um, the, the three papers were, were really interesting. And actually one of the things that I thought, I mean, I'm just, you know, just trying to make, come up with something to make a connection through through the, the three papers and what better thing than your own work. <laughs> so uh, what I was thinking was, was this idea, it felt like all papers actually were, we're kind of dealing with some kind of sense of like of like collapse of, of either platforms or 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 kind of environments or or kind of um, subject positions onto one another 
I think with, with Gabriel's as this, this sense of you know this collapse between you know the space of fantasy and reality around around the 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 body of the porn star, um, and in 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 uh, Alex's paper, this this kind of shifting or this movement of of, of or this um, progressive or or embodiment in terms of like different uh, aspects of of, of Pigginess from you know, the cop pig to the sex pig to 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 the anarchist pig, all these different kind of um, all kind of kind of collapsing onto one another. And and with with Jamie, when you're talking about about this conjuncture that 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 is <laughs> that you, you that you are talking about, uh, and and you mentioned the the increase during the pandemic of, of uh, OnlyFans. Uh, production and registration, but also you know the horny on main uh, that was a big thing on Twitter, uh, where suddenly the kind of the professional Twitter, the 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 sex Twitter, the you know whatever all, the, all that kind of collapsed, and you know I think it's platform collapse, right? The term that people use in in, in social media studies. Uh, so this idea of the the you know these threshold uh, experiences. Um, seem to kind of really cut across the, um, the three papers. And I think my question is really kind of asking you maybe to using maybe this idea of the conjuncture, what is it about the conjuncture that we're living in that facilitates or that, that seemingly creates these, the possibilities for th this collapsing of these different realms and platforms and this kind of porosity <laughs> of one to another. If you have any thoughts on on it at all, I, this is just like what I I the thread that I was hearing throughout the three the, the three presentations. Alex, do you want to go first? He's Your mic, to... Alex. I was very happy to be in this panel, and I see the interconnections. And thank you for this question as well. Uh, when it comes to me, I think one way of uh, addressing and responding to this question in regards to the thing that I presented today is it is very important to see how uh, mobile phones, for example, which have become smartphones, I personally use the term mobile phone ex precisely to emphasize the distinction between the conjecture in uh, mid-2002 uh, and now. This was not a smartphone yet again. Even then, it was a precious phone. Either in that conjecture, there was some sort of magic fetishistic power into it that makes it so important that it becomes almost equal to risk, not necessarily your life, but your physical integrity. But you might feel that it is an object of danger. So you can just run away from a man, but you still want to uh, uh, be part of that risk in order to have this mobile phone. So um, I think this is this material reality, this that becomes a holographic reality is a way of drawing examples when it comes to that. I really truly enjoy how you can jump uh, from sex to politics so easily, not only in the course of one uh, story, but in the course of one grinder dialogue today uh, Grinders, uh, I mean, if I had a different material to speak about, it would be that sometimes I use Grinder uh, to troll. So people will say, "What you want?" I will say to him, "I would like happiness, uh, money, creative freedom, all the things, all of the sort of things that you don't want to say." So if uh, Jamie was using as a data accidentally some of my Grinder dialogues, <laughs> that would be a huge problem and a rapture in the conjecture because he will say what he will he will have to uh, find out if I'm a robot and I'm not sure what will be the answer to that. So yeah, that's it, that's my answer. You're kind of a Dadaist really, aren't you? I mean, this, this is properly uh, praxis. <laughs> okay, you know. um, and Yes, what is it about this conjuncture that allows these thresholds to be crossed? That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would go back to Gramsci and say that, you know, we are, we're, we're living in, so he, you know, one of the ways of uh, periodizing uh, things is 
um, whether we're in moments where things, where the, where the relational forces are kind of settled or whether they are in crisis. And so the first bit of conjunction analysis was Stuart Hall's uh, book on mugging. And um, he talks about the social democratic consensus falling apart and the anxiety around mugging in Britain was a, a reflection of that anxiety. It wasn't because mugging had increased. It was because um, it was a way of focusing all the anxiety of the social democratic consensus um, falling apart onto that one particular media object. And I think we're in a similar moment. So, so, you know, neoliberalism held uh, for a kind of long period of time and, and now we're in crisis. Um, you know, there's the populism, there's, uh, there's Corbyn and Sanders, um, there's, you know, Biden you know, te trying to kind of resuscitate technocratic neoliberalism. And we're in this moment now of utter crisis where, I mean, complete, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know how more to describe it. It's this absolutely crisis-ridden conjunction where um, everything is falling apart, essentially, or the experience is as if everything is falling apart. And I wonder if that gives some kind of uh, account of why everything is up in the air at the moment. And, hope, you know, when Johnson won with a landslide, it was, you know, thought, okay, well, maybe populism is going to win, but coronavirus has thrown that all into, all into doubt again. So I, I don't, we haven't stopped living in a sense of unsettled, unravelling, and I don't know how it's good. Yeah, so I, that would be my answer to that question, I suppose. Can I, can I just add, add something else? I'm using my host privilege just to just keep on talking. Uh, but why is it making everybody so horny? <laughs> because, I mean, and actually something that also came up, came up I think, with, with that I really found fascinating about Alex's paper is that is this like... Is it trauma or is it horniness? I'm, am I being beaten up? Is it violence or, or, or is it, you know, yeah. there was this really like um, blurring of all these things. And, and you go on, on, on Twitter these days, especially since COVID and everyone is horny. Uh, so there's this like, I don't know, resuscitation in some way of some level of like desire or some kind of libidinal aspect to all of this, that I think is actually putting, amidst all the digital mediation and that, et cetera, is really resonating or amplifying something that is very much kind of embodied in material, right? I don't know, just I'll shut up now. Can I say something? Can I say something about that? Yeah. Okay, speaking about different conjectures, but I always wanted to challenge gay history and find continuities in places where we usually find raptures. And I think that uh, the way that we use hookup application is, and quite a lot of things that we discussed of, over the previous days, another place to find these continuities. When it comes, for example, to this brutality, the way that I transform a brutal person into a sexual instrument, even if this brutality is against me, and even if this brutality does not have necessarily a sexual content. I believe that what was happening in the 1950s or in the 1960s, long before, or when we did not have the gay identity per se as such, and we had uh, gay behaviors, when people wanted to have sex with straight men, for example, and they would achieve that, things that we had also 20 years ago in Greece, in the same places that I'm describing now. It was very easy to have sex with a straight man who was a taxi driver. Now, in this digital place that we live in and inhabiting now, I think we have quite a lot of evidence that the desire for this type of personality, who is support, we say that is straight acting. We don't want even a straight actor. We want someone who perform and embodies embodies an ideal of uh, a choreography of masculinity, which we want to treat it sexually. This desire is not at all new. It's persistent, it's there, and we have to respect it. And I think one way of respecting it is not just by critiquing or debunking straight acting as a form of repressed homosexuality or as a form of toxic masculinity, but allowing it to, uh, to understand that this is part of our desire, of the game of our desire, it does not have a very necessarily a bad output. Having said that, I want more people in Grindr trolling about uh, their philosophical anxieties. I want to debate with people 
about the current political situation and ended up hate fighting them if we have different opinions. Uh, I want more games in Grindr, and I do believe the reason why hookup applications are boring, it's not only because people act like straights, it's people are, I don't know us, I don't know, I live in the UK most of my time. Explain to me what is going on. Um, I can't answer that, but my, I mean, my, my answer to, my answer to Joao's question is, um, I mean, it, it, your, your question makes me think about the OnlyFans, I mean, I think you started the question maybe with the OnlyFans uh, thing, and my, my, I mean, again, like, we're, we're kind of still collecting data, so I need to, you know, what, you know, simply, if, if we manage to speak to people to do that, see what they say, my initial reaction to that was, a kind of extension of the argument I made in my book. It's like, okay, right, it's because there's no, and the way that I framed it in this presentation actually is because um, there's no other way of making money, right? And this is, you use your body as capital and da 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 da. But I mean, of course, the other reason is, one of the other reasons might be is that um, people, you know, a quarter of people are hooking up. Why are people more horny? A quarter of people are still, a quarter of gay men still are hooking up, three quarters weren't. Right, and so the only thing that you could do is go on to only well go on to Twitter or go on to and and you know the the thrill of exhibitionism and voyeurism and so it just seems that's the obvious place that to protect yourself from the possibility of COVID transmission, the horniness must surely be the frustration of not being able to have as much sex as you might have done in a kind of pre-lockdown and and the digital becoming you know making that horniness much more visible. Uh, for you to ask that question. I mean, that was a, perhaps a more kind of straightforward answer, but yeah, that I wonder, John, I can't hear you. I kind of think that you, 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 you're moving towards the thing that feels like it resonates for me. I think, um, and this is where I really agree with Alex, I think this idea that um, times of crisis result in rupture and everything changes, I think it's kind of like a romanticization of the way in which history and social and cultural change, change works. Things start to change. It isn't as if what happened prior to that point just disappears. And we're still living through a neoliberal moment. There is morphing into something else. So there is always a continuity. And I think perhaps what happens at times of crisis is that things that were there already kind of rise to the surface the, um, the real kinds of demarcations and distinctions between domains of behaving, acting as a professional and acting as a personal um, individual, that those kinds of things start to get kind of destabilised in moments of crisis and change. And I wonder whether that's what's happening. I, 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 don't, I, I personally don't think people are more horny. I think they're as horny as they ever were. Yeah, maybe people being locked up has made them a little bit more horny. Maybe people are more... For yourself, John. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm probably revealing way too much at this point, and I'm starting to realise this will be on Facebook, uh, YouTube <laughs> point, so I'm going to roll back from this and distance myself from it. I think there's something there. Right, have we got any more questions? I want to, like, a last comment only. Yes. That what we experienced in lockdown with this boom of digital expression was the culmination of 10 years of austerity through which quite a lot of people had as an entertainment to use a screen in various ways and outlets. So over the last 10 years, the use of Facebook or Grindr or any sort of other digital sexual or non-sexual platform of communication has been some sort of experimental booth for quite a lot of people and when the lockdown happened there was a time for full-time self-surrender into that and parallel to that especially when it came to only fans there was also time for them to experiment with different type of exposures so quite a lot of people who work in for example uh, in a uh, in a precarious white collar job in a desk realized that it is possible for him to survive and do uh, this job, as opposed to people who work in education like me, who two years ago I lost my job just because uh, my colleagues discovered that I participated in a queer art festival oh with same nudity. So I think these 10 years of austerity and digital uh, playground needs to be studied in order to understand the current conjecture and how it develops now. I agree. Do we have 
um, any more questions from the audience? Wow, have you got anything you want to say about what's happening tomorrow as we're moving into our final day? Yes, it's okay. I'll, I'll just plug, plug it. I'll just plug it in now. Um, yeah, getting into day 10 of this viral masculinities online extravaganza festival of a conference. Um, tomorrow we start later. Uh, it's our last day. Uh, we start at 3 p.m. Uh, British summer time um, with the panel Masculinities, Responsibility and Safer Sex with Angelo Boyas from uh, Dublin City University in Ireland, uh, Chase Ledin, Christian Muller from, well, the first from Edinburgh, the second from uh, IT University of Copenhagen, and then a, a paper from uh, by Jordan de Greenblatt from York University in Canada. And then we close at 9 p.m. London time with the, our last keynote by Tim Dean from the University of Illinois in the in the US. Uh, yeah, that's it. I hope you all join us. Uh, I'll try to put some kind of wrapping up thoughts as well together for just kind of some closing remarks uh, for after the keynote too. But uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. See you all tomorrow, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.